February in, in Fort Myers, John Lester pulled me aside and asked for some time for dinner. And for those of you who don't know about John Lester, he was 22 years old a year ago in August when he was diagnosed with lymphoma, putting what looked to be a very promising career as a left-handed pitcher at risk, which is uh, considerable risk. Lester finished his chemotherapy treatments in December. And here he was two months later beginning his comeback. He, he told me, but I appreciate it, that we both went through life altering experiences in the summer of 2006. He said, I, just, I really need to talk about it. And I told him that my experience after severing brain aneurysm at the end of June was a lot different from his. But, um, first, fortunately, I really don't remember almost anything um, about becoming ill and going to the hospital. Because of that, I explained the burden was really all my wife, Gloria, and family, and, and friends. And he looked at me and he said, well, that's what I want to talk to you about. And I said, well, I'm not really sure what I understand. He said, well, look at up. I understood what was happening to me. It really wasn't that difficult. I was told what I had to do, that I would recover, that I would be all right. He said, what's difficult for me has been how do I deal with my parents and my friends and my family? He said, this is what I'm turning to. I need your help. That, from a kid who turned 23 in January, to 10 months later, picks up the deciding game in the World Series, despite Alex Rodriguez's announcements. And now we feel that. Out of the field after that finishing game in Denver, he came over and hugged me and he said, you know, it was a pretty good year for us, wasn't it? Uh, he's a remarkable person. It was, and well, almost every day I reiterate that I'm one of the luckiest persons on earth. It's not about luck. One of the things that John Lester and I talked about at length in February was just that. It's not about luck. It's not about luck that I'm here tonight, or that Lester won the clinching game of the World Series. Good fortune? Yes. Great care? Yes. Great love and support and family and friends? Yes. Luck? No. Understand, had I been stricken 24 hours earlier, I would have been in O'Hare Airport in Chicago, and I wouldn't be here right now. But I wasn't. In the morning of June 28, 2006, I was driving down Route 151 in Mashpee, heading for my favorite one, Gold's Gym. And, um, I got an intense headache, and so intense that I did not think I could drive anymore, and pulled over in a parking lot, stop and shop, and, I called Gloria to let her know that what was happening, and I was really just dead tired from a weekend in Chicago. I was going to lay down in the back seat, back seat, sleep for an hour, and then, you know, I'll be fine. I'll go work out, and I'll come home, and I'll drive into Boston. I do remember opening the back door of my car, and that's really about it. And Gloria and our dear friend and neighbor, Celestine Guy, began driving from Katonga to find me. But in the meanwhile, I had my intervention of good fortune, kindness, and humanitarian action, and I stress the word action. Agnes Rocket Baldwin saw me, helped me, talked to me as I got in the back seat as much as I don't remember that, and saved my life. She called 911, and the great folks at Nashville Fire and Rescue got me to the Falmouth Hospital. She, she knew, as Gloria knew, that that's where I should go, because their emergency room, and they had the helicopter to get me to Boston and bring them to the women's hospital. It would have been really easy for most people to just let me lay down in the back seat and sleep. It's, but it's not luck, it's great fortune. When my body and brain went awry, and someone so kind and responsible, as it turned out, also a nurse, was knowledgeable and was there. At the same time, you know, at some time in our lives, we're all victims of the unarmed modes of life, and some of us have the fortune to experience what those chimes of freedom really mean. I honestly remember very little about the next few weeks and hours and Weeks, yeah, I, I know that the, the, uh, the Mashpee Fire and Rescue people got me to Falmouth in minutes, and the care I got at the Falmouth Hospital Emergency Room was incredible. That I was air back in Brigham that morning, and as it turned out, I got like, the best hospital in the world. I was fortunate to get a doctor named Arthur Day, who friends around the world remind me constantly he's the greatest neurosurgeon on the planet. I speak and I write for a living, and I've been told by doctor friends of mine that. It should have been a year before I was back on air attempting to talk and to go back to being a, a full-time television journalist. But I was back on the air at ESPN in two and a half months. Uh, and believe me, it was nothing because of everything I did. It wasn't what I did. It was because of Agnes and the great 
care from Dr. Andy Whittemore and everyone at the break of the, doctor, the genius of Dr. Day is because of the incredible strength of the foundation given us by family and friends like the Z-Cobs and the Keenans, our Brookline neighbors like the Kennedys and Lynn and Tony Chamberlain. I remember the day that I was taken by ambulance from the Britain to RHCI. And when I got to my room, he was sitting on my bed with Bobby Ward. A few days later, Gloria brought me one of my first stacks of mail. And in it was a FedEx album. I opened it. It's a little show and tell. But, and I found this chain. And it came from Brother Nell. And it was from Don Mattingly and his wife, Kim. Kim had given Don this chain when they were juniors in high school in Evansville, Indiana. And he had worn it every day for the rest of the remainder of his life. They sent it to me and said, to save you. And it's, it also say, has not been off my neck since, um, no matter what they want to do to me in the airports. <laughs> the weeks from the day I arrived at RHCI and when I got home to Katonga will never be lost on me. I was one of those blessed sorts that by then really wasn't sick much because of the care that I had gotten in Boston. I can honestly say, except for two days, I hadn't been in a hospital since the day I was born. So between the Brigham and RHCI, I found out what health care really means. And I do mean care. I was never rushed. I was held down. Dr. David Lowell and his staff were extremely cautious with me, knowing that I was slightly impatient, could drive everybody completely crazy and wanted to get out of there and get back to work. Um, but when I began my speech therapy, I told him, you know, I'm going to listen to you because you know what you're doing. Uh, I have no idea what I'm doing or where I'm going, and I have to say, I'm scared out of death. And the teaching of the therapy RHCI was absolutely remarkable. What I remember best is that every exercise I did, and some of them really did remind me of like doing those sixth grade math things where you jump a riverboat in Pittsburgh, and you know, in Cincinnati, who gets in the pool, we go first. And, uh, <laughs> But they were rationally and intellectually explained in terms of purpose. It made the exercises more compelling, more challenging, better understood. It made it a lot easier for me to get out of there in the heart. A few days after I got home, oh. a few days after I got home, I took a break on the day. He evaluated. He looked at me and said, hey, you're fine. You know, the operation was right. Your brain is right. You have great rehab. Work back to a normal life. Your rehab was perfect. They asked me who was coming in to play the Red Sox next week, and they said, uh, White Sox. They looked at me and said, Well, I'll be the end of your game. You're real players. He said, uh, I want you to convince yourself that you're completely healthy. I want you to be driving by yourself, go to Cape, to Boston, go see. Uh, you don't see you from the Red Sox. Drive back. You know, you're fine. Just don't do it. Well, seventy years after pulling off the road in Nashville, I drove to New York, Delaware, to see how to hang out with my friends on the Red Sox and do what I love to do. Less than two weeks after that, I did four shows for ESPN and Delaware Park. In one of them, I interviewed Tory Hunter, who is one of the best people I know in any walk of life. We were finished. He looked at me and he said, hey, uh, you know what? You're going to be one tough man. I said, no. No, I'm not tough. I have a great doctor. I have great care. I have great family. And I have great friends. And I'm back to what I love to do. It's because of a lot of you people in this room that I, that I am not. I am able to do what I love to do. Um, there was a moment this year in, in September. It was a Sunday night game. Is it? All right. 